so hello here to everyone today. Um, I've just been told my name's Oliver Trello and I'm currently studying chemistry right here at Victoria University of Wellington. And um, during my time here at Vic, I've actually had the pleasure of being lectured by Sir Paul Callaghan himself. And for me, it's very inspiring when I see people at the front of the lecture theatre talk with such passion, enthusiasm and an engageable manner, especially when you know that they're a world-class scientist. So I think it's entirely at this uh, event today, which is about, based on science communication, is in his honour. And another thing that I um, admired about Sir Paul is he didn't, uh, he didn't seem to narrowly focus on his niche subject. But you'd often see him in, uh, in the papers or uh, you know, having written articles or given talks about you know, the broader implications, the sort of social, economic, uh, administrative and educational sides to, to modern day science in New Zealand today. You know, he definitely saw the big picture. And, um, so with that in mind, I hope to give you a big picture presentation today. Um, hopefully not compromising too much on the technical detail as well. So in choosing a topic today, uh, it really got me thinking why I love science so much. And a big part of it for me was viewing scientists as the people who are coming up with new and creative uh, solutions to our big problems and our um, big questions. So that got me thinking, what's the absolute biggest global problem I could think of, and what can we do in New Zealand not only contribute, but hopefully get a bit of a leg up in the process as well. So, the absolute biggest problem that I could think of was um, the quest for renewable energy. You know, I don't think it's too misleading to say that our world economy has been based around oil, you know, cheap, abundant oil. Um, it's all pervasive, really. It's been used in pretty much everything from electricity generation, um, transport, packaging, manufacturing. And uh, it served us pretty well, but one problem is glaringly obvious. It's not a renewable source of energy. It's going to run out. Um, peak oil is um, the point in time where um, the maximum rate of oil extraction is going to be reached. And the International Energy Agency predicts this point for 2012. There are some people that say that's too conservative. We're actually hitting peak oil right now. Um, either way, it's situation serious. And this is going to have long-term, uh, widespread negative economic effects. And to say nothing about the huge problem faced by global climate change. And of course, cl uh, climate change ties back into the economics when you take into account increasing prevalence of things like emissions trading schemes. Okay, so I, sh I guess I should mention that not all countries have oil as well, and in the future, I think you might see, you know, it's going to be harder to ward off hostile countries as well that might be interested in your oil, if you do have it, that is. Um, so coupled to this, the fact that um, worldwide electricity demand is likely to increase uh, due to things like modernization of developing countries. And what you've got is a strong incentive to be able to produce energy in a way that doesn't require fossil fuels. Okay, so one solution you can do this is uh, nuclear power. And we've got to be honest with ourselves, there's some really good things about nuclear power. You know, it doesn't use fossil fuels, it can create a, a huge amount of energy, and it's fairly reliable as well. But there's some glaringly obvious problems with it as well. The fact that it's not uh, renewable either, it's very expensive, and the radioactive waste is a huge problem. I mean, we only need to look at Japan to see the disastrous sort of consequences uh, it can have. We know all too well about earthquakes here in New Zealand, so I think our nuclear free stance is definitely a wise one. Okay, so the solution, I believe, lies in the sun. The sun is the most abundant form of renewable energy. And in fact, it shines down more than 5,000 times more energy than the total uh, power consumption by humankind. Okay, so... It's not so much a problem of energy scarcity, it's about how can we harness all the abundant energy that's right there. So I think right off the bat, it's probably, um, I think it's good to say that although it's a huge problem, it's, it's a problem that's ultimately solvable. Um, okay, so there are, very, there are a lot of um, renewable uh, energy sources that are actually based on the sun. For, uh, you know, for example, uh, hydropower, which is um, our major um, source of renewable energy here in New Zealand, can actually be linked back to the sun. If you think of the sun heating up bodies of water in the sea, that water evaporates and rises, and we make use of that gravitational potential energy as it comes back down 
the side of our mountains in the form of rivers. A sort of similar chain of reasoning can be applied to uh, wind power as well. And in fact, even petrol, to be honest, because the chemical potential energy in the oil was once an ancient forest, which in turn got their energy from the sun. But it's not a renewable form of uh, solar energy. Um, so New Zealand already does a pretty good job of renewable energy, actually. Uh, about 70% of all of our electricity ge um, generation comes from renewable sources. But there's still a lot of work to go. And when you talk about things like hydro, a lot of them are stretched to capacity. There's um, varying water levels and stuff like that. And um, they too have a geography, you know, uh, they're quite invasive on the geography of, uh, of our land. So the solution I want to talk to you about is probably the most direct and less invasive uh, form of this solar energy. And that's photovoltaics. Okay. So what is photovoltaics? It's not to be confused with solar thermal energy, which uses the heat energy from the sun to heat bodies of water, which then you can use or uh, use to generate steam to drive a turbine to, uh, to generate electricity. It uh, generates electricity directly from the sun into electricity by um, something called the photovoltaic effect, which we'll talk about a little bit more soon. Okay, so what are the good things about solar? Uh, apart from what we've talked about, it's quite direct, it's invasive, it's quiet, it's attractive, it's relatively easy to install, it's easy to maintain as there's no moving parts. The thing I really like about solar is um, it can be produced on different scales. It's quite hard to manufacture a hydro dam in your background, but with solar it's a very viable option. Um, and, you know, it sort of um, puts people in control of their own power generation, which is quite good. And it gives them sort of security from, you know, from that. Uh, from that. And it generates electricity at the point of use, which is really good as well, because it can actually save you quite a lot on transmission losses and stuff. So, so and on the other end of the scale, they can produce, be produced en masse in large solar farms, which can, which, uh, can produce you know, quite an impressive amount of electricity. OK. So I want to talk about a little bit about the uh, existing technology today, um, which is based on silicon. It's essentially a bilayer device um, consisting of electron-rich and electron-deficient silicon. And that's sandwiched between two sort of electrodes up here. The top one's transparent to let the, uh, the sunlight through. And basically what you get is the, the, the electrons from the silicon absorb the light and they get promoted to a, a conduction band where they're degalycolosed from the nucleus of the atom and they're there free to um, conduct the electricity. This is a little bit simplistic, but uh, the solar cells I want to talk about differ from this slightly. So. I think the take-home message about silicon solar cells I want to get through is that they're made from expensive materials and they're very difficult to manufacture. And, um, you know, it's to do with sort of purifying the silicon, which kind of uh, uses a lot of elevated temperatures and uh, vacuum de de deposition steps, which are quite complicated. So the alternative to this being actively researched here in New Zealand is uh, using uh, polymer solar cells. And that's basically using uh, conducting polymers or plastics as the active substrate uh, for this material. OK, and New Zealand's actually already played its part in con um, conductive polymers with a former Victoria graduate, Alan McDiamond, getting the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2000 for it. And um, the medal's actually displayed in that new Alan McDiamond building just past the library if anyone wants to check it out. It's quite a, quite a beautiful medal, actually. I was quite impressed. <laughs> um, so in terms of solar cells, or what their advantage is, is they're going to be, they're going to reduce the cost of, uh, of, of production. And in particular, what I want to talk about is this sort of roll-to-roll -roll print processing sort of thing. Because these uh, materials can be produced in solution at low temperatures with no need for vacuum deposition, what you can kind of get is their productions, you can produce screeds and screeds of this using Technology that's sort of familiar to us already, you know, um, from making flexible food packaging. So if you think of like a chip packet, which is um, maybe has a layer of aluminium and plastics and dyes across it, it's all based in solution, printed out really fast, and this has got the potential to um, reduce costs by drastically um, upping the economies of scale. Um, but basically, the main problem is they currently lag behind, uh, lag behind the silicon technology in terms of efficiency. So in terms of that's the biggest challenge, is upping the efficiency of these cells. To do that, we need to know a little bit more about how they work. So let's see if we can roll up our sleeves and do a bit of science. 
So this guy here is your um, conducting polymer here. So you, what you see is long chains along here sort of thing. A couple of little side chains for solubility purposes. But the main thing is if you kind of look at it from this direction, it's alternating double and single bonds through our, these are carbon atoms by the way, and that allows it to conduct electricity. And so its job is to uh, absorb the light and you see electron going from you know, a lower level orbital, I hope some of you are familiar with uh, orbitals and stuff, uh, gets promoted to a high level or orbital here. Um, the thing that's different uh, to silicon is essentially that, um, the electron is still bound to the molecule and it kind of wants to go back down here uh, after a certain amount of time. So what we need to do really is to generate a free charge. We need to rip that electron off the molecule. So that's when you bring this uh, other material in here. And these, these guys are really cool. They're basically 60 carbon atoms in the form of a tiny, tiny soccer ball. <laughs> And again, side chains for solubility. But um, it's, its sort of role in this sort of solar cell is you bring it extremely close to this guy and the electron can kind of jump across to him sort of thing. And in that way you separate the charges out and this can conduct electricity as well. It's a poor absorber but it's a good conductor. So that can conduct electricity away and the solar cell can work. And what I say, these transitions are happening quite fast, actually about a nanosecond before it wants to jump back down on, you know, to recombine um, on this own material. And so in that sort of um, time frame, it can only move about 10 nanometers uh, in length sort of thing. So you really need to encounter one of these guys, you know, in sort of 10 nanometers. But also you need about 200 nanometers um, to provide sufficient absorption. So what you end up with is, I hope you, hopefully you can see over here, is sort of this bulk nanostructure material, you've got little domains of each about of oh, about 10 nanometers length of each of these two different alternating materials. Okay, so that's a bit about the um, mechanism. Okay, to open up, optimize this um, sort of uh, efficiency of these solar cells, as I mentioned before, like the time scale is extremely small, you know, sometimes within a few uh, millionths of a billionth of a second. And so to probe these occurrences, we need a method that works on these time scales. And so our uh, research team here at Vic, led by Justin Hodgkiss, is um, using state-of-the-art laser technology and our extremely fast laser pulses of light, sequences of laser pulses of light. So the first pulse sort of triggers the absorption, and by analysis of the subsequent laser pulses, we can gain information about how the electron behaves. And so we're, um, we, we, yeah, we here at Vic are sort of investigating the different param uh, the effects of varying different parameters like um, using new materials, um, the ratios of different materials, the solvent system that we use and stuff like that. So it's in this way that we're ultimately the laser technology is helping us to design better and more efficient solar cells. And now uh, this is a little picture of Justin here with one of the instruments. And his, he's actually doing a lot of his research in the Ellen McDiamond building, just a floor up from where the metal is stored as well. So it's quite exciting research and I think it's even made more so by a close proximity right now. Okay, so the future of polymer solar cells. Um, so what we'd like to do is up the efficiency to a target of about 10%, which is it's very doable. Um, from 1992, they're about 0.04%. Now they're, um, the top ones we're making about 8.59%. Uh, so at this sort of percentage, we think they will be economically um, competitive with uh, silicon solar cells. And then we can start really, really utilizing the sort of economies of scale of this roll-to-roll -roll print processing. So this is just a graph about the overall um, price trends of solar PV. And um, what we want to do is be operating to try and get that down a bit further as well. Um, There's just some figures about the um, cost of power in New Zealand, um, 2008, it went up 40, the residential went up 44% from 2000. So they're only going to keep rising and projections about um, how much, uh, uh, what the pricing is for uh, per kilowatt hour is about, it's about in line with this commercial figure here as well. So hopefully that can um, sort of like induce a bit of a widespread uptake in residential homes. And I want to talk a little bit about um, sort of policies that we could use um, called like feed-in tariffs, which is the government and the uh, energy companies working together to provide long-term contracts for people who use these sort of systems uh, and grid connect and sell back to the um, sell back to the grid. So I think these sort of um, schemes and stuff have been very um, very good at increasing uptake in uh, places like Japan and uh, Germany. 
it's the German summer right now, and they uh, recently posted 20% of their um, 20% of their one of their days was uh, entirely solar powered. Um, so, if you think about small, tiny contributions adding up, these are quite big numbers. And in terms of uh, using these technologies in solar farms, you know, I would look to partner with our friends across the ditch in Australia, sort of thing. They've got abundant sunshine hours and lots of space right next to pretty thirsty cities. So hopefully we can partner up with them at some stage. OK, so the challenges facing us, again, I mentioned is basically increasing the uh, efficiency of these things, which you know, we can do by increasing the charge separation, which I've talked about, by the structure or morphology of the, uh, of the cells, um, designing new materials that um, increase absorption and voltage, and also increasing the product lifetime and oxidation of electrodes. But yeah, there's a lot of research being done into all sorts of these fields, and it's actually coming along pretty fast, and I'm very hopeful for the future about it. Another big problem I've written uh, in a different color down the bottom there, because it's not endemic to uh, polymer solar cells as such, but it's probably the biggest problem with um, solar PV at the moment. It's the problem of energy storage. These things don't work when there's no sun, you know what I mean? <laughs> so. Um, I mean, this is not necessary. You don't necessarily need energy storage. You can just sell back to the grid and reduce um, uh, electricity demand for in other ways, sort of thing like that. But there's um, it's been some good uh, advances in energy storage right now, which we want to talk about. So there's been some advances in um, conventional battery technology, liquid uh, iron metal battery technology, um, large scale solutions like pumping water uphill and then sort of uh, utilizing that energy back as it um, when you need it, sort of thing in the night time. But I want to just talk briefly a little bit about uh, a solution that I find really elegant, which is um, fuel cells. So, um, so this graph here just shows you the sort of uh, in the black here you've got your um, you know your solar production, and then in the purple you've got your household use, and you can see there's a bit of a discrepancy in there. So basically, this diagram here is a bit about it's a simple diagram about how um, fuel cells work. So basically what you do is when you've got too much energy, you use that energy to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. When you need that energy, you re recombine them, the reaction gives off energy, and you can use it that way. And so here's just a simple diagram about how these can be integrated into our houses. Um, so in this diagram, you've got not only linked to a reversible fuel cell, but you, if you've charged that up as much as you can have, you can sell back the excess to the grid as well. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about... Um, the sort of consequences that this could provide for off-the-grid living as well. For like a uniquely Kiwi perspective, I'm quite tantalized by the fact that you could go and sort of make a, a batch in somewhere secu secluded like the Coromandel or something like that. And with these sort of uh, technologies in tandem with mobile um, broadband or something like that, you can be completely self-connected but completely self-contained as well. And this has broader implications for overseas like places like Pacific Islands and places like Middle East and Africa. Um, so you see in Africa and things like that, um, a lot of the countries are going straight to mobile, mobile um, communication technologies, eschewing the grid. Um, um, maybe there's not a grid, or maybe it's politically unstable, maybe you know, the supply is not so, um, not so good. So I think these sort of, uh, sort of uh, you know, off-the-grid solutions are really going like, to provide a bit of stability. And in tandem with um, sort of mobile technologies, kind of produce a paradoxical effect where you get these off-the-grid uh, living situations actually increasing the connectedness of the world. OK, so br bringing it back to um, polymer solar cells and how it can benefit us. Um, there's been a, bit of, you know, a couple of individual hiccups in the green market, but it's absolutely assured to be a dominant force in tomorrow's market. And this re represents a way that we can be world leaders and get our foot in the door on this sort of market as well. So there's um, potential for profits in many areas. Um, so you're talking about things like marketing, branding, installation, um, maintenance, you know, any way we can provide high-tech jobs is, um, is a good service done. But even manufacturing, it can, it's, uh, it's, it's actually a viable option to have these things manufactured in New Zealand. Like I said before, it was an analogous to like making uh, flexible food packaging. It's a little bit more high-tech than that, but it's actually nowhere near as high-tech or as capital-intensive as making something like a plasma screen TV. So there's actually a good potential to get a good industry going here. 
and uh, should we choose to uh, forego that sort of manufacturing role or part of the manufacturing role? There's actually plenty of, plenty of money to be made in things like patenting new materials and novel processes and licensing, uh, licensing these to other companies. And that all comes at quite a modest cost, really. So also, involvement is going to you know, improve our clean green image, which is obviously vital for things like tourism and agriculture and New Zealand in general. And I mean, who knows if you, know, if you drastically reduce the cost of solar, there might be another Nobel Prize waiting in the wings. That's only going to inspire new generations of Kiwis to think more interestingly about science, and I'm sure that's what Sir Paul would have wanted. But that's coming back to the real reason we kind of uh, were talking about making these things in the first place, the long-term financial and environmental gains that we can get from solar cells. So this is a really new, exciting technology. I'm glad we got our foot in the door, and hopefully we can use it to squeeze a bit more opportunity out of them in the future. Okay, thank you. I think that's um, all I have to say.